Gen AI to me is like a drug that has been introduced to our economy, to our organizations, and to us. We actually don't know the right dose to take, the efficacy of the product, the side effects, the toxicity, or even the right diet to follow when we're using this drug. But this drug has been introduced across hundreds of millions of people. And the institute I lead at Harvard, Digital Data Design Institute, over 65 researchers and our research colleagues are focused in on doing clinical trials of AI in the workplace to see what the effect is of AI for knowledge workers, those that are doing high value work in many organizations. So what I'm gonna do with you today is to walk you through some of the studies that we've done and the findings, but also what it means for you as leaders who are charged with trying to understand how to bring AI inside of your companies and how to get AI across your customers, your stakeholders, and your employees as well. The first study I wanna to talk to you about is where many of our graduates go into consulting or investment banking, where they come in, they are asked to do tasks that are both creative as well as analytical. So we worked with Boston Consulting Group and we have a study of 758 people in a clinical trial of AI, those with AI and those without AI. And here's what we discovered. The AI has a very much a jagged technological frontier. There are some things that AI is very good at, and when you use it for that function, AI performs incredibly well and people get better. But when you use AI for the task where it's not good for, your performance drops and drops dramatically. And good people using AI for tasks where it's not designed for perform way worse. So the first part that we see is that it's a massive productivity boost. What you're seeing here is a graph showing those using AI and those without AI. And this rightward shift in terms of performance is quite dramatic. It's dramatic in the sense of if you were median performance in the control group and you had access to the AI, you would then show up at the 95th percentile in terms of performance. And when we did this study, we found that smart people working at BCG were faster, got more work done, but also had better output compared to those without AI. And this is a completely randomized trial, so the cause of the error was directly in the, in the direction that we're pointing it towards. But when they use a task for what the AI was not designed for, something bad happened. Basically, the control group got better, and those using AI got worse. And so this is the dramatic thing that we want to be careful about. As AI gets introduced in our companies, in our organizations, we have to be thinking about task by task, is the AI going to be helpful or is it going to hurt performance? My postdoc for Brizio del Aqua calls this phenomenon falling asleep at the wheel. Very good people using very good AI perform worse than those without AI. And that's a really important consideration we should all have when we think about this. So this is our first clinical trial. Our second clinical trial was with uh, an old company, even a company older than HBS, Procter & Gamble. And they make soap, right? They use products that are in you, around you, inside of you, or on you. And we were thinking about how AI actually impacts teamwork. So here we were focusing on early stage innovation projects at PNG. And like the prior study, this is a clinical trial. So people got randomized with access to AI, teams got randomized with access to AI or without AI as well. Here's what we discovered. In this case, AI now transforms from a tool to a teammate. And I'll show you data to bring this alive to you as well. First of all, what we discovered is AI, again, boosts quality. What we discovered in our study was that an individual using AI is as good as a team without AI in a cross-functional setting. But a team with AI produces the best quality of ideas compared to everybody else as well. So that's the first thing. AI boosts quality of the ideas being produced. Secondly, what we discovered is that AI brings you access to expertise that you may not have. So in our treatment, when individuals were using AI or not using AI, what we discovered is that the solutions they proposed for their innovation challenges tended to be biased towards their domain expertise. So we had commercial people working without AI, their ideas were more commercial. Technical people, R&D folks, when they were proposing ideas, their ideas were more technical. But individuals with AI, when they produced solutions, created solutions that were more balanced, that had the right mixture of technical innovation and commercial innovation built in. And that's what P&G is looking for. They're looking for combinations of commercial and technical prowess in their products. And that matched, that matched what teams were doing when they were working on those problems as well. Now, the other thing we discovered in this clinical trial 
was that those folks that were less familiar with these tasks of early stage innovation, when they had the AI tools, performed as well as the more experienced people as well. So AI gave them that experience and that capability along the way as well, which is quite remarkable. The last thing we discovered in our study was that people felt great when they were using AI. There was more sense of positive emotions and less sense of negative emotions when they were using the AI tool as well. And in this case, what was dramatic here was that those using AI felt way better than the teams without AI. So if you think about what a teammate does for you, a teammate gives you expertise, a teammate gives you sociality, a teammate gives you coordination, and we discovered that the AI tools do the same for you as well. And that's the cool thing of this transformation of the tool becoming a teammate. And this new, new configuration will matter a lot for us in our organization. Now, the last thing I want to tell you from our studies of many organizations is that while the performance capabilities of AI models is increasing exponentially on a every six month basis, every nine month basis, the absorption capability of most organizations is linear. It's linear. What that means is that every six months or nine months, you're gonna be exponentially behind what the models can really do. Now, this is the real problem because if your competitor figures this out and can stay on the exponential curve, then all of a sudden you will be behind. And this technology is not one like Wi-Fi or the browser where we had large debates about should we bring Wi-Fi into our organization? Should we bring browsers into our organization? This is really about changing the nature of work. And if you don't know how to change the nature of work, you'll be kept behind over and over again. So waiting for this technology to get better or deferring your decision to adopt is going to be a real disaster because those that figure out to keep up with the exponential curve will just keep getting ahead of you. And the change process you will face as most leaders will be much higher when you, when you make the decision to adopt as well. So then let's talk about what we learned from this and what leaders can do with regards to AI. The first thing I want to sort of go back to is what is this changing the cost of and what does it do to our business models? And I'm showing you about a 30 year history of technologies that have changed costs dramatically. So the web browser and the internet basically lowered the marginal cost of information transmission to zero basically. And when everybody could become an information producer as well as an information consumer, we had new business models show up because Google and Baidu, for example, gave us search. They said, now in a world of lots of content, you need to be able to search. And so the cost of information transmission went to zero, and then all of a sudden, the new business model showed up. Some of you may still remember Napster, right? And the illegal music you may still have on some of your hard drives. Well, Napster, what Napster did is it did two things. It unbundled the song from the album, but also it lowered the cost of music access. Before that, we'd have to go to record stores and buy music there. Now we just download it on our phones. And then again, new business models showed up. Steve Jobs showed up and said to us, 99 cents per song, and he keeps 30%, right? And Spotify showed up and said, all you can eat subscription. So new business models showed up when the input of the technology lowered the costs along the way. Then when we go back to the mobile era with iOS and Android, they basically, again, lowered the cost of software distribution we used to go to Best Buy and Sears and Micro Center to buy software in boxes. Now we just download that. It seems kind of ridiculous that we would buy software in boxes, but that's what we used to do. And also it democratized who could be a software developer. Many more people could now develop software. And that gave us TikTok, of course, new business models. So the question we've been asking ourselves is what are generative AI tools lowering the cost of and what are the new business models? I don't have any insights yet on the new business models that are emerging. But what I can point to is that for us in our labs, at our institute, what we find is that AI is lowering the cost of expertise. And if companies are just bundles of expertise, sales, marketing, new product development, and what that means for us, and we as individuals spend lots of time acquiring expertise, we get good at one thing and one thing really well, and if that cost of expertise is lowered, then we're in for a wild ride going forward. And the evidence I've given to you, both our BCG study and our Procter & Gamble study, points in that direction very clearly. So how should we think about this lower cost of expertise? So imagine just a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution of skills, of expertise. Most people are going to be at average. 
right? And we hope that most of us who are in this room and are watching are on the right tail of this expertise. Now imagine what AI does to this expertise curve, right? What we see happening is that this expertise curve shifts to the right. All of us now can get access to these superpowers that are embedded inside of these large language models. And then the thing that is so interesting and what we see in our data very clearly is that the left tail gets actually cut off because if you're below average, there's nobody at BCG that's below average, but we discovered those that were below average at BCG in the tasks that we gave them, when they had access to this AI, all of a sudden became above average. So the left tail gets cut off, and the question for us will become, what will happen to us on the right tail? Will we know how to use these tools? Will we adopt them? Will we make them part of the ways in which we work? The second thing we see clearly is that there will be a replacement effect. Some jobs will go away for sure but also we'll see augmentation. So basically we're gonna get the Jarvis suit from Marvel, right, that, that, that Iron Man has. And all of a sudden we'll have these superpowers that allow us to play with the gods. But then also I think very excitingly, there'll be transformation. New jobs, new roles will be created that we can't imagine right now. I saw a news story recently, that, for example, that at Amazon warehouses, there are robot wranglers that are needed when the robots go off, off filter in the warehouses. That's the new job, right? And so how does work gets transformed and the new jobs that get created will be the things that we can all look forward to. We've seen and heard a lot about agents. And if you believe what I showed you, that AI goes from a tool to a teammate, then for sure, teammates will show up with a slew of agents. At the Harvard Business School where I teach, and I taught a course on data science and AI for leaders, all of our MBA students this year created five machine learning algorithms and two agents. And they want to take those two agents to their jobs. And the question will be, will the companies allow them to bring their own agents into the workplace? So this is happening today. This is happening today. And all of these students did vibe coding. None of them actually know how to code, but they could use these AI agents to create brand new algorithms in machine learning that gave them superpowers to analyze data for business. But as this happens, we will also have this phenomenon as well. Your boss might also be an agent as well. Now, I've often asked in many settings, who likes their boss? The answer tends to be 50-50. But we can expect and do expect that there will be configurations in which the agent is the boss. And while this may seem futuristic, this already exists today. If you take an Uber ride or if you get Instacart to deliver for you a meal, Who's the boss? The algorithm at Uber is the boss. The algorithm hires people, the algorithm fires people, promotes people, gives them pay, gives them rewards. It's all being done algorithmically. So today, millions of people are using AI as their boss, have an AI as their boss, and also now increasingly AI as their teammate. And this feature is here. It's just, as William Gibson says, it's not evenly distributed yet. And that's gonna be the key challenge for most of us to figure this out and bring it into our organizations. So what happens to strategy? Because at HBS, we think a lot about strategy. What we expect now is that strategy will now be not just about you and your competitor, but it'll be you with AI versus your competitor who may or may not have AI, but also wherever the AI is at. You will have to find the differentiation in what the AI can do off the shelf for 20 bucks a month. For 20 bucks a month. And what is the new special sauce you will bring for your clients, for your customers, for your stakeholders inside of your company? Because as these models improve exponentially every six months and nine months, we will have to figure out what this means for our organizations and what the strategy look like. So what should you do now as a leader? How do you actually put this into play? We've been working with many companies over the last three years since our institute was founded and we have a four act play for all leaders to follow. First, they have to learn, they have to invest in learning. And the learning has to be not about the bits and bytes, but how AI impacts business. Of course, you need to understand a bit about LLMs and large language models and generative AI, but the key thing has to be, how does this tool impact AI? Second thing is that you have to do, you have to get your hands dirty on keyboards and build AI tools and solve problems with AI. Too many leaders I find defer the doing to their minions, right? 
So you go figure it out. I'm too, I'm too busy doing strategy to actually be using AI. To, in too many exec ed classrooms, I find leaders that will talk about AI, but won't use AI and do the AI. So you have to invest in the doing. The third thing is you have to imagine. You have to imagine new business models and new ways of working and new strategies. But you can't imagine without you, you doing it. Because if you imagine without doing it, you won't know what the capabilities are. And finally, you have to actually act. Because this technology is about work. This technology is about, about change. Workflow will change. Work processes will change. And this is going to be the most critical thing that you as a leader can do, which is to drive change and make your organizations fit for change with this technology. Thanks very much.